mio. That's pl that's singular, isn't it? It's well, well. fratello mio's. I, I don't know. <laughs> Andiamo well, as we go. I was yeah. I was talking uh, to uh, James, so it is singular. So. Okay, yeah. So we go, my brother. Uh, yeah, exactly. We go. We are live. We are ready. Well, Declan, over we don't to have you. a way. Uh, we don't have a way of uh, of like knowing if we're live or are we live. Yeah, we are live. Yes, yes, we are live. And we are live. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Welcome to a special live stream of Let's Talk Assassin's Creed, the number one show for all things Assassin's Creed. Hello, everyone. Uh, yes, and welcome to this special episode of Let's Talk Assassin's Creed. Um, we're joined by uh, not one, not two, but three special guests. Um, let's introduce everybody uh, who you'll be hearing today. Declan, you should introduce yourself first. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, I'm Declan. I'm one half of the podcasting team Let's Talk Assassin's Creed and a very big Assassin's Creed nerd. <laughs> and I'm James, the other half of Let's Talk Assassin's Creed, who you've probably heard before, and uh, yeah, been co hosting this show with Declan now for about a year and a half. Arshak, over to you. Hello, hello. I am Arshak, the founder of AC Landmarks, and yeah, I'm here to uh, talk with. Um, the Assassin's Creed community uh, and it, and one of its writers uh, for the Assassin's Creed community re relief that we are doing. Um, how about you, Wolfie? Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> I am White Wolf Whispers. Please call me Wolfie. It's a whole lot easier to say. I am um, pretty much a moderator in lots of different places, but my original home is the Assassin's Creed subreddit. Um, I just like Assassin's Creed and I get into different communities and end up being a mod there. So it works out very well. Um, I'm also just a throw out, uh, a, um, Ubisoft, uh, star players. So I'm very well entrenched in this, uh, in this community. Very nice. Nice. And Darby, welcome uh, to the show. Hello. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm, uh, I guess I'm Darby McDevitt, and I'm a, an Assassin's Creed writer and narrative designer, director, person. Have been for a little while, a minute. <laughs> Ooh. And it's very happy, I'm very happy to be here and for this cause, um, so thank you all for inviting me. That's thank a great segue to talk about the cause, Arshak. Yeah, thank, thank you for joining us for the, for the cause. So yeah, um, we are here, uh, to uh, fundraise for the Assassin's Creed Community Relief, which our uh, cause is uh, d directed towards uh, thing, sending relief to the uh, to Syria and Turkey. Uh, they recently went through a horrible uh, earthquake that changed many lives and. Uh, those countries. So uh, we are here to basically raise funds and have a, you know community time questions with with Darby um, while 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 the donations are coming in. And it's also a, a way to say thank you um, to our donors uh, for for donating for the cause and uh, causing great change, uh, great good change to uh, many of the people that have uh, that have had their lives altered uh, in the in the past month. So yeah, uh, thank you guys, everyone for for being here. It's going to be a good time uh, to, to talk about Assassin's Creed and raise money with you guys. <laughs> yep. It's... Is the, is there... uh, the donation information is on the screen, right? It is. We have the overlay on. We passed. Um, <laughs> we we keep raising the uh, the goal because the community is so generous, and um, we've had so many people host streams, um, so many donors um, giving generously, and yeah, we crossed over fifteen thousand dollars yesterday. 
um, our new goal is twenty thousand dollars and uh, i think uh, this community doesn't cease to, to to be generous and i think we'll hit it um, before the end of uh, week two of this event and yes the the numbers are on the screen so people watching you can see um, where we are and if we get any donations today that would be very nice and you'll see that appearing on the screen as well wonderful very very exciting so yes we did um poll or uh, we put out uh, posts and tweets about uh, gathering up questions uh, for today's event some of the questions are kind of like amongst ourselves and then some of the questions uh, came from the subreddit and some of the questions came from ac landmarks uh, twitter uh, thread and i i think we have a a good selection of questions i think um at the beginning the majority of them are going to be based on ac revelations uh, but we have some other questions then we have some rapid fire questions and we have hopefully we can kind of end with uh some silly questions and we just we, we've got a good mix of things today yeah yeah um so shall we make a start um so darby yes i want to yes, ask you <laughs> uh, I want to ask you, since since the fundraiser is focused on both Syria and Turkey, uh, have you been to those countries? What what landmarks did you uh, love to visit um, if you went there, or what landmark would you like to visit from these two games that we are focusing on during the fundraiser? Uh, yeah, actually, during the... Um... Well, so when we make Assassin's Creed games, we often take uh, research trips to the locations where we're making a game. Um, Revelations happened in such a short time that we didn't really have time for a research trip. But when the game was finished and we were doing uh, basically our final press tour, where we um, invite uh, a number of press outlets to come and just play the game for five hours or whatever, uh, we actually hosted a press event in Europe, the, the European one, uh, there was a separate one in the North America, but in the European one was actually in uh, Istanbul, uh, which is the current name for Con Constantinople. It was actually called Istanbul way back then too. But um, so we were in Istanbul for five days, I think. And what was really lovely is uh, I'd done enough research on the game by that point and in the course of writing it that I was able to be paired with a woman, a local woman who was taking people on a tour and so we would split this tour and I would sort of give a kind of a tour based on what was in the game and she would give more of a deeper historical um, overview of the location. Um, and we, we, we went to a lot of the major sites that are featured in the game. So the Hagia Sophia, the Grand Bazaar, um, the, uh, the cisterns, the really crazy uh, you know, Roman Byzantine cisterns that are beneath the... Uh, that Ezio visits and um, at, yeah. at one point in one of the LGSs, yeah, the uh, Galata Tower. Um, it was a beautiful city, um, and we had such a great time and just just wandering the city. And of course, now the number of uh, the mosques there is like, you know, quite a bit more than what was there in in uh, Ezio's time. So right. we didn't get to we didn't get to put in all the beautiful mosques, um, but I visited a lot of them. And the the Grand Bazaar was fantastic, and just the the ritual of going in there and seeing. Now I didn't buy very much anything significant, but like the the ritual of seeing like a, if a person's going in to buy a um, a carpet, and is like, okay, we're gonna haggle about this carpet. We're gonna sit down. We're gonna go get you tea. Some kid's gonna run off and buy it, get get tea and bring it back, and we're gonna sit down. We're gonna drink tea and talk about the price of this carpet and just the 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 life and vitality of that place and the gigantic stacks of spices that you would see everywhere and these mountains wow. of spices it was uh it was you know i'd never been um i'd never been i think east of probably cologne <laughs> like uh, up until that point so it was wonderful to just get a, a, a completely different view of the world and and i had a such a great time and so i rec i do recommend a, a trip to istanbul for anyone I who's really listening. Like, I really like the fact that you that I mean I've seen the dev diary for like for like revelations and oh, yeah. I, I saw that uh, there was like uh, sound sound work done and yes, yes. 
and yeah. in the Grand Bazaar. So like whatever you hear in Hagia Sophia, inside Hagia Sophia, for example, is the actual atmosphere of Hagia Sophia or, yeah, or, the, or the Grand Bazaar, which yeah. is really cool to capture the culture. Yeah, yeah. And the audio team. The audio team has this tool where they basically put a bunch of little sound emitters inside a space, and then they 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 do a kind of a frequency sweep where it's like, right, and then they catch all the reflections, and they're able to then model those reflections as a as a digital reverb, so that they can now apply that in the game. So if a sound impulse is made, it can it can echo and reflect exactly how it would have in that historical space. So we did that. For a few spaces in, uh, in 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 Revelation, I wonder if we've, we've I'm sure we've used that in other places too in other games, but being in a in a a mosque of that size is you know it's actually it, we're infrequent it's infrequent now in Assassin's Creed right I think maybe in AC two uh, there were interiors like that but there's not that many interiors we've gone to especially in the latest trilogy where the the interiors are a bit smaller and more modest, right? especially in Valhalla. Like, this is an accurate longhouse echo. Like, <laughs> yeah, like, uh, yeah, not, not really that exciting. It's a, yeah, it's a it's a gigantic gigantic mosque, and I mean the Hagia Sophia holds holds a very very uh, special place in in Turkey's um, history, and I mean that's that's also like uh, the other part of the question that I wanted to ask you. Uh, which is uh, like what prompted you to choose Istanbul as the conclusion? It wasn't. Of it wasn't me. Al-Hayer's so it wasn't me. I just, so I don't know the. I presume it was the beauty of the city, but I was because um, a because uh, Revelation started out as the DS game Lost Legacy, and I was working in Seattle at the time for a company called Gryptonite, and so Ubisoft gave us said, "Hey, we want you to make a game set in." in the Ottoman Empire, so it wasn't like our choice. So I don't actually uh, know the I don't know the rationale behind it, but I do know that they thought, man, it's actually too good of a city to put on a DS game. So they canceled that game and then invited me over to to Ubisoft Montreal to write the the AAA game. So I I've never actually asked who had that decision. I presume it might have been it might have been Patrice, you know, the 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 original team, because it was that game was being the, the DS game in Istanbul was being worked on the same time that Brotherhood was being conceived, so ah, it might have been. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, well, they made the else. right decision by by, yeah, by yeah. hiring you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to. I do want to point out that we are now over sixteen thousand. Assassin's wow. Creed series has generously Beautiful. donated enough to put us up over. Yes, that's <laughs> very exciting. Yeah. Thank you, Assassin's Thank Creed you, series. series. Yeah. Please be generous. This is a yeah. This was a devastating earthquake, and it hit a lot of very uh, remote areas that are that that are, really need this kind of assistance. So thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so in uh, HC Revelations, at what point in development was it decided to connect the stories of Altair, Ezio, and Desmond? Uh, ah. Were the were the Altair memories originally written? when uh, Revelations was going to be that Nintendo game or what they yeah. kind of brought over mm-hmm. into. Yeah. That's a good question. That's actually a, a, one of those w- wonderful examples that when your opportunities change your, and your, your creative um, impulses change with it. So when it was a DS game, just like a D- AC Discovery and AC Bloodlines, it did not have a present day. So that meant there would, there would have been no Desmond uh, whatsoever in the DS game. The, the plot was roughly similar, although it was set in about 1507 and not 1511, like the Revelations' is Lost Legacy. And it, so it just followed Ezio, but he was doing the same basic thing. He was trying to find a way into this Masyaf hidden library sanctum thing. Um, so Altair was involved, or that, uh, he was, let's say, the motivating factor. But there were no Altair memories um, playable in the DS game as well. So then when we transfer it to a AAA game and it becomes directly after Brotherhood, okay, now you have to have Desmond, right? Because it's the continuation of Desmond's story. So that was the first thing that changed. It's let's rethink the story, but let's make it, you know, meaningful to Desmond. Like, why does he have to go through these memories? Um, so 
immediately we add Desmond memories and we had subject 16 because we thought, hey, let's, you know, let's finally pull back the veil on him a little bit. Um, and then, and th there was an original idea that maybe the, the revelations would be a really big multiplayer offering because, you know, the multiplayer game was also a, a big thing at the time. And there was idea that maybe this will be a multiplayer offering plus a little bit more ex extra Ezio stuff. Not more than a DLC, but maybe a smaller thing. But then when the kind of the, you know, the, we, we kind of read the reaction about Brotherhood and we like realize, oh, Ezio is a beloved character. Let's, let's really give him a good send off. So they actually said, you know what? Um, you can actually make a longer single player game make it a bigger Ezio story. It probably would have originally been like maybe a four-hour Ezio story, like a really brief wrap-up. But they gave us, let's say, the equivalent of do 10 more missions. I'm, I'm just off the top of my head, but we're giving you, you know, a budget to do 10 more missions. So extend the story a little bit. So we did, but we thought, how can we make it even more interesting? And I, and I do recall sitting and just with Alex Amancio, the creative director, and it's probably in like March of the game, that the year the game came out, and saying, like, why don't we add playable Altair sections? The original idea, though, was to have Altair sections in Istanbul back. So this would have been this would have been this would have been before the Ottoman conquest. We had to nix that idea because the city would have had to change drastically. You would not have had any presence of the Ottoman Empire there, which means all the minarets would have had, had to come down. Any sort of you know, reference to, uh, you know, Islam as a, as a, as a religion or the, the Ottoman culture, because it was a, it was a, it was a, quote unquote, a Roman or Byzantine town, uh, back in 11, well, I guess this would have been about 12 something, 12, let's say 1205. I don't know. Um, so that as the world director, a guy named Mustafa, he kind of looked at it and was like, ah, no, we'd have to, we'd basically have to make two different Istanbuls. You have to make the pre-Ottoman and the post-Ottoman. So we said, well, what's a different way that you can um, uh, bring Altair into it? And we're like, well, let's go back to Masyaf. I'm like, okay, yeah. So there we, made, we made a pre, you know, pre, uh, <laughs> let's say a pre-Mongols and a post-Mongols Masyaf. Um, and so that, that actually became the way we did it. And we said, okay, we'll have five or six memories with Altair. Um, and it was really exciting. And I remember the, the mission director, Falco, we, we just like sat down like, okay, what's the coolest way to like reuse Masyaf? Um, so it worked out. I, I, in my heart, I would have really loved the, uh, the uh, Altair in, in Constantinople idea because then you'd, you'd have this like, Altair did this, you know, intense parkour path and now Ezio has to do this same thing. Oh, um, kind of like... How it started? How well, you know, like in, started with like yeah, exactly, exactly, Ariel? yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, but okay. also like Brotherhood, where you know, like Ezio puts an apple somewhere, and boom, now Desmond gets to go get it. You know, that kind uh, of okay. you know that that feeling would have been really cool. Yeah. Um, but really, a lot of work. Um, but it's but it's really cool. It's really cool that that you that you guys incorporated both like Syria, and and. Turkey in one game. I mean, a uh, thing. Uh, Mas Masyaf is in Syria, um, and yeah, and Turkey. Uh, well, Istanbul is in Turkey. So, like you know, a AC Revelations is like you know a good mix of both, and it's um, yeah, it's like really cool how that how that turned out. Um, cool. But yeah, like you were uh, Wolfie. You wanted to ask a. Uh, question about the Altair memories? Yeah, were there any others? Uh, well, you kind of touched upon this. Um, were there any others you wanted to bring up in Revelations? Um, mm. You bringing up the Polo brothers, for example, was very specific as you showed um, them sailing to Constantinople. Any other historic moments that you wanted to include? I don't think so. I think I think the dream would have probably been that we just wanted to expand on them as much as yeah. possible. The mm. the uh, like I sat in a room with the writer of the novel and we sort of planned out more stuff. So maybe maybe there was a moment where some of the stuff that's in the novel that's not in the um, game might have made it in. Uh, but we but that that's a much broader story. Yeah. Um, 
So I think it would probably been more like, like I'm sure we wanted to do a, maybe we, like when the Mongols attack and destroy Masyaf, I think maybe we would have wanted to do more with that, but uh, I don't think there was anything major cut. It's like, like I said, it, it was a, it came late in the idea, in the, in the development. So we didn't get too ambitious with it. It's not like we said, like we have 10 Altair moments and we cut it to five. I you think had one we year always, to make it. <laughs> yeah, I think we always had five moments, maybe six, but I don't think anything drastic got cut. Yeah, they're mm. definitely some of my favorite moments from from Revelations yeah. for sure. It was it was great. It was fun. Yeah, it was fun to go back to that. I mean, I never wrote for Altair, you know, which was it was fun to to fill him out as a character and make yeah. him make that him is true. age. So. Um thing uh sticking to the the historical aspect of things um since you know ac landmarks and stuff anyway uh which historical figure in ac revelations were you most excited to write about um uh which landmarks were you most excited to incorporate into the, into the story uh if you want to also answer that like you know uh i know i know suleiman was was also a figure that uh, you wrote, wrote, wrote about so um, this is like a like yeah. a, a second parter to the question from Servalon's fl uh, flowers. Uh, how did you research and write the character of Suleiman? Yeah, just like uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think I think uh, Re Revelations was my first, you know, uh, console or let's say triple A or mainline title. Um, I know that I did a. A decent amount of research at the time but I don't think like if I look at the amount of research I do now for Assassin's Creed games I would have called that a, a paltry attempt I, I don't really recall like diving into a specific source of, of Suleiman like he's you know all told he's a, he's a cool character but he, we don't go too in depth to his character and, and of course it he's depicted before he's actually the, the Sultan of, of the Empire so um, He's young. There's, yeah, there's not much to draw on. And like I said, the um, Lost Legacy was going to be set about five years earlier, so he would have been even younger. He would have been about 12 or 13. Um, so mm. we aged him up a bit. And that actually might have been a reason why we changed the timeline, so we could actually have a bit more of a you know a wise teenager, a <laughs> silly man, rather than a, a young teenager. Um, he was fun to write for. A character that w I wanted to appear more in the game... Uh, would have been Selim, his father, uh, who there was Ahmed and Selim, and they were kind of at war during this time. Um, and Selim spent most of his time, if I recall, outside uh, Istanbul. Like he wasn't really, he was kind of amassing an army and he was threatening to come in and sweep up and take over. Um, which he did. <laughs> yeah, which he, which he eventually did. And then yeah. Suleiman took over after him, after about eight years, I think. Um, I wanted a bit, I think I wanted a bit more of that tension in the game, but we just couldn't find a place for it because it wasn't like we were doing the outskirts of, you know, uh, Istanbul. It was just the city and then there was a bit of Cappadocia. Um, so, yeah, you couldn't really show that kind of thing. Um, with regard to the other part of your question, I think it was the Grand Bazaar that was always the most interesting to me because we, as soon as you think about the Grand Bazaar, this labyrinthine structure, you, the gameplay ideas and the the idea of using it for gameplay, running through it and over the top of it, always struck me as like that's going to be cool. There's going to be yeah, it is cool moments, and you can get lost in there, and it'll be fun. I think uh, I think that was it. Um, following following Janissaries and yeah, exactly. And, uh, the the thief uh, that was connected to like Sophia or something like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was that was like uh pretty pretty cool stuff um uh james uh i think you're 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 playing the uh, the yusuf uh memory that's cool um <laughs> anyway uh yeah we're gonna be like playing uh fan favorite memories maybe maybe we can play your favorite memory too darby uh i think what's your favorite memory uh, from from AC Revelations. Well, it would be probably 
in the making of it and not in the playing of it. I can barely remember the game now because <laughs> all all when you're when you make things like this, all you see is the ingredients that went in to make it. You know, like you're you're the chef and you know how the sausage is made. So it's like I don't see I cannot see these games as stories and like experiences. All I see is the technical uh to wizardry that went behind making it like i'll be like oh that animation could have been better ah oh, that line yeah. could have been written better why did i put a comma there you know things like that um <laughs> you know why did i why does the hook, hook blade have two parts why, <laughs> oh we, we're coming to yeah, yeah we're i know, coming I know. To that <laughs> <laughs> so it's so so what what's a favorite favorite memory while writing it i one of the things that so when you're working on a game like this and you're a creator and you're you you see every stage of the game right i see i saw istanbul when it was just gray boxes you know gray box buildings and you start running around it you start you start getting a sense of of what the game's going to feel like and whatever and, and one of my favorite parts in any assassin's creed game i imagine this is the case for a lot of people who work on open worlds is when you f first start to see the art come in and you can run around the city one of the things I love doing is that I'll run around a city as it's coming together and I'll just look for places that I think might be oh this will be this will make an interesting scene here or or it'll make a you know an, an a tense moment or whatever you do, it's like getting inspired by your own game as it comes together is really really quite fun um, so those are actually my favorite memories of just seeing Istanbul come together Especially the E3 demo, right? Because it, we worked on that part first. So walking, th walking through that market and seeing spices, and I have a really distinct memory of our animation director Kama at E3. And I was watching her demo the game, and there was an, an older Italian journalist who, I don't think he was very, I don't think he was, he was probably sent by his newspaper to go, hey, go cover E3. But he wasn't like much of a gamer. So he was just looking in awe, and his nose was like six inches to the screen. He was looking at all the beautiful detail as Ezio was walking down this path. And he's like, stop! That fish right there, can you eat those fish? Oh, man. <laughs> and, I, and Kama was like, no, it's just for decoration. Okay, so he walks on. Wait, stop! Those spices! Can you eat those spices? It's like, no. No, you can pretty much just climb things and kill people. And, he's like, and he was very disappointed because he thought like maybe this was the first open world game he'd ever seen. And he's like, oh, I could just, I could just you know rent an apartment in Istanbul, and uh, live my life and maybe meet some friends and go you know hang out. It's like no, it's an Assassin's Creed game. There's just certain things you can do, and the rest is set dressing. <laughs> but it was really it was really beautiful because it was like really genuine. He was really enamored with the setting and and uh oh who. Just back ejected it off of the Galata Tower. I, know. <laughs> I don't know if our, I don't know if our our, our audio is <clears throat> synced up with the, uh, the so video, but when you were giving your your answer, and about thirty seconds ago, I put my hands up like this. That was me back ejecting off the Galata Tower, <laughs> and now the live oh, okay. stream has okay. caught up. So uh, back okay. so, back yeah. back to the story. I'm having a great time. You carry at on. At least it happened <laughs> after, and not at least happened after, and not before. Because I, I, I looked like I was prescient or something, like I had some powers. <laughs> anyway, all right. <laughs> Declan, go ahead with your question. So were there any other historical figures that you were thinking of incorporating into Revelations, be it from Altair's time uh, or Ezio's? I don't think so. I don't think... Uh, maybe there was... So I think Suleiman's grandfather was Bayezid, if I'm saying that correctly. Bayezid, um, the the father of Selim and Ahmed. Um, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't think, uh, I don't think so. Like I said, like um, I don't think this period in 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 Istanbul's history and the Ottoman history is like incredibly rich. It's it's like sandwiched between major events. Like, um, what does Suleiman become uh -oh. Sultan? It's like fifteen twenty. What happened? Uh oh. <laughs> Guess what I just did. Oh, my god. Twice in a row. <laughs> twice, twice. <laughs> anyway, I'm okay, going to go okay. do another okay. memory. You carry on. Yeah, do you want us to just be quiet while you, you know, finish this? <laughs> you know, we can root, so hard. We can, root, we can root for you. Okay. <laughs> and the worst thing is that this, the, the, it's, out of, it's out of sync. So. Yes. Um, 
Uh, and, and actually, from a historical, po- a non-historical point of view, maybe there was a moment where we wanted to get, uh, you know, like Claudia in there, uh, Ezio's sister, um, but that ended up being just written letters to her um, in the, you know, uh, interim sequences between sequences, interim moments. So no, yeah. I think I think I think uh, Revelations is kind of what you see is what we intended, by and large, maybe even yeah. more because like like I said, it was originally supposed to be a bit smaller. And we got the go-ahead from, you know, uh, the the editorial team Harvard. in Paris to be like, hey, make it bigger. Oh. So, so, uh, so I think it's more than we intended. Actually, we all got excited. Ten more yeah. missions? What do I do? <laughs> <laughs> the possibilities. <laughs> more Ezio is better Ezio. Yeah. More more Altair. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, I think, some... uh, yeah, move to yeah. your question. Wolfie, yeah. Yep. Some of my favorite scenes are uh, from some of the more emotional moments, uh, like Darim saying goodbye to his father when he says, All that is good in me, father, began with you. And then um, Ezio's love letter to Sophia at the end of Embers. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was just curious how how easy it is to write these more emotional moments. Is it just something that you, you you gotta feel the moment or is it something you oh I wrote that down and now I gotta bring it into the story hmm that's a good question I um I don't know that it's I'm not sure I'm not sure how that t- sort of thing works um, but what I do know is that you you have to in order to in order to make an emotional scene possible you have to have found the right story you ha- you'd have to have started from let's say good first premises right like if you're if you're let's say a, let's say someone's writing a, i'm not going to name any names because i'm just making up a generic example but <clears> let's <throat> say there's a, a game where the entire story is just hey there's a really bad guy um and he needs to die and because he's he's just making people miserable and he needs to die and you're like okay that's great that's a very simple straightforward story in that premise, there's all there's kind of like well that the ending is self-evident. If this guy's bad, he needs to die, and you're a good guy, so you got to kill him. You don't actually find much room for drama or high stakes, right? So the the story has to have some high stakes, um, and uh, to begin with, so that as you're writing, you can discover these moments like oh my gosh, this is an emotional moment. This this could be an emotional moment where the the main character is struggling between this and that and so if you start with embers, it's like, okay, Ezio c- clearly by the beginning of the game se- or b- the movie seems to be in sick. So if you start with a premise, like, is he going to make it to the end of this movie? <laughs> like that's a good, that's a good premise to start with. Right. And then you can find emotional moments um, or with revelations, right? Like he's, he meets the idea, the intended idea was that Ezio is an assassin. He's going to get some, he's, he wants to follow in Altair's footsteps um and uh and, and yet along the way he finds all these reasons to actually stop being an assassin like he meets this woman named Sophia he gets involved in this um this this war between brothers in Istanbul where it, it's it's hard to see what the correct answer is because the templar in it Ahmed seems to be the more reasonable one and Selim seems to be like the, uh, the maybe the cruel one um so who do you back or do you back here? Do you not even get involved in it at all because it's not your fight? Um, and so that that was kind of the question running through, I think, Ezio's mind is like, how long am I going to do this? How long am I going to be an assassin? And that's why at the end he's like, okay, I've done enough. I've seen enough. Uh, time to time to pass on, pass it on. Um, and so if you can start with those premises, then then it becomes easier as you write it to be like, oh, man, you know, I've written myself into a, a tough moment like um yeah like i i didn't have kids at the time i wrote revelations um but i kind of maybe imagined what it would be like to have kids and or, or to i was a son and i obviously have a father so you know i that sentiment i guess i was just drawing from my own personality and saying like hey you know my dad's got all these cool good qualities and and you know i i'm happy to have to say that I take after him in some ways, maybe not on all of ways. Um, he's a fighter pilot, so I'm, I'm, not, also, a fighter, I'm not a fighter pilot. Um, that, anyway, yeah. That, so. that, 
that uh that that saying like you know uh all that is good in me father you know uh uh all that is good in me began with you father it, i mean it re it resonated with me because like I, I take i take my uh video game uh video game nerd like and like historical uh historical uh the love i have for video games and for history i take it from my father so mm. when when you when Doreen said that to Altair, I'm like, oh, wow. The, the, this game just, like, is speaking you got to up, me. You got up and you walked in and you gave your dad a hug. Uh, yeah, basically. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and, it's and, it's yeah, also, it, I, would say, I would say that um, good writing also, I think, I, I hope, is that people saying things that resonate in a way that um, could be true but is not obviously true. Like, you don't want... You know, you don't want characters going like, you know, the sky is blue. You know, yeah, we all know that. But you, you want to like feel like you're unearthing like truths that were hard to actually pinpoint. But then when somebody says it, you go, oh, that's really, be you know, that I never thought of it that way. Or, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> writers, if you are listening to this podcast, take notes. Take well, no, <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of different ways to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I mean, we're learning from you, uh, which, which we're grateful. Um, and and I also I also wanted to uh, remind people that uh, if you are just joining us, uh, we are asking Darby community questions, and uh, we're we're taking donations for Assassin's Creed. Uh, Community Relief, uh, which is helping uh, kids in Syria and Turkey uh, basically be taken care of um, after the horrible earthquakes that have happened. Um, so, so yeah, we're just gonna continue on asking questions. But uh, thank, thank you, thank you so much for your uh, generous d d donations. Uh, We've received a lot of uh, donations since since uh, we've been asking questions. Uh, so yeah, uh, thank you, thank you so much, AC Series Six Keys Master Master Hikate. Um, your your donations are really appreciated. Um, but anywho, let <laughs> let's let's continue on with. More yep. questions. So uh, the next question is a community question. This is from Tax Alex, who actually is one of our most generous <laughs> um, donators. Um, his question is, with Revelations and Embers, you wrote one of the most emotional goodbyes for a video game character. If you had the opportunity, which characters do you wish you could have done more with? Maybe not even just Revelations, but throughout the series, in any of the characters mm -hmm. you've written for. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know. I, I think uh, it, it's, it's probably a lot of minor characters. Like I would have done, I would have loved to do something with Yusuf in Revelation. Oh, yes. I love Yusuf um, so. I would have loved to do like a, like a, like a weird, wacky uh, Anne Bonnie, Mary Reed, Calico Jack <laughs> spinoff spin -off game. Oh, wow. Like, it ends in like awesome. horrible tragedy. Maybe it ends right before the tragedy, but you know, like... You know, um, the, uh, maybe some stuff on Ducho. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. The, uh, yeah. He just gets like a point and click graphic adventure game where he's like, <laughs> yeah. Um, just constantly being hit by women. <laughs> the, oh, who else? I'm going down the line of the games uh, I've, I've written. Maybe maybe another maybe more Altair and Maria that would have been cool. Oh, um, that would be awesome. Um, and actually, there are like some Templars I think too, like a like a like a Woods Rogers game or something. <laughs> so I don't know, because he was a, Woods Rogers was quite an interesting chap. So like it'd be great to young Woods Rogers figure out how he gets that scar and all that. Well, he was actually shot in the face. That's how he got that scar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway. 
Yeah, Ben Hornigold would have been a good one. Yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. Blackbeard. And have, like, little little DLC spinoffs for all those. You get to do, like, a, you know, a couple hour-long missions with each of the pirates, and then, <laughs> and then, you, then you reconvene to see them all die. <laughs> so, Assassin's Creed yeah. gets a spinoff of just historical figures living their lives as yeah. action as possible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Uh, that would be that would be cool. Um, so let's move to the other uh, question, Declan. Um, you you have a question uh, from from uh, someone in the community, right? Uh, yeah, it's from Justin I. Um, what was the writing process like for AC Revelations, and do you feel like you accomplished what you set out to do with the narrative? Yeah. So. It, that was like I like we've kind of talked about before. That was a weird one because I did a lot of research in 2010, early 2010, um, in Seattle, just outside Seattle. Uh, I lived in Seattle, but the, the game company was like 15 miles outside Seattle, in a place called Kirkland. But I just love Seattle so much, so I suffered that commute. Um, but I wrote a script for this game, Lost Legacy. Uh, that then the game was to, well we we were told hey we're you know we're not going forward this this game. Little did you know we know that the, the behind the scenes Ubisoft were like planning to upres it. So uh, I get this call a couple months later. I actually decided I was going to quit uh, video games for a little while because I wanted to go take some film editing classes. So I had this script with me, um, but it was it was kind of the property of Ubisoft really. But I, it was on my computer and. Um, I decided, oh, I'm going to go to New York and take film editing classes. And as I'm like driving through Gordon, Nebraska, I get a phone call from uh, uh, Ubisoft that says, do you, want to, do you want to work for us and write this game? So I said yes. And so I took those film editing classes um, and my visa wasn't going to come through for like many months. So this is now October of 2010. So I'm actually having long distance meetings with the team, the Revelations team, and I'm I'm starting to like deconstruct my first script, figure out if there's anything I want to keep from it. But as we develop the story, I basically just start writing this new script for Revelations in about November of 2010, uh, as they're just starting to get going on it. I'm like living in a place in Queens, like North Queen Astoria in Queens. Uh, in a basement apartment, just writing this script as I go to film editing classes during the day. And as soon as that's over, and as soon as my visa comes through, I go up to Montreal in, in January of 2011. So I've, I've already been writing kind of on my own. And as soon as they give me my desk, I like I, I plop all of my writing into our script writing tool, um, which is basically like final draft, but it's our own kind of thing. And I start doing that, and by you know February, March, I have a, a draft of something. But then we're like, oh, let's add Altair. So I like, okay, whoosh, go back, rewrite. And so I, I remember by about April, May, having a pretty complete script, and then we had to do all the voice recording by probably like the, by the end of May or something. It was in those days that we weren't actually doing any motion capture with the live actors. What we would do is. We would write the script, record it, and then put that script on a timeline, and we'd have actors mime to it, right? Um, AC3 was the first one to do actual motion capture. Um, and so you can, I think you can tell, like, the quality goes... Um, and, uh, and we've done that ever, you know, ever since in to very, to various degrees. But so it was really easy to, like, record, write and record the script really quickly and, and then record the dialogue because we weren't relying on, like you know booking motion capture time doing all that like that's that can be a long and intensive process um the, the results are fantastic but it can be very uh, intense um yeah so then post e3 we've made some tweaks to the script post e3 i remember is the last i stayed behind in los angeles and we were using a studio in los angeles because roger was down there roger craig smith and a lot of other actors there was a um a studio down there i can't remember what they were called but they were in venice beach so i would stay in a hotel down there and go to go to work every day at this studio uh, for a week while we were finished up all the rest of the dialogue recording um so that that was direct whatever whenever e3 2004 2011 was the dialogue was finished after that and by that you're like yeah you're done with the script 
the last thing you record or the, that you write is all the code, the, uh, the what codex entries, I guess, or the not codex entries, but the the database entries, right? All the that's the last thing because it's just text, so you don't have to record anything. So really, the most intense writing that is a long answer for, <laughs> but <laughs> the, the the writing for Revelations happened between I'd say November. 2010 and April 2011. Mm. That makes sense. So yeah. a good six, a good six months. Um, it's not a long game, but I got to iterate on it quite a few times. And we always it, like. It, it, well, it, and that's a, I think it's a, is it a is it a Hemingway quote? Writing is rewriting. Like I feel like that's my work certainly always gets better if I can rewrite and rewrite and rewrite because the first draft is always like looks almost more like a half of a Rodin statue, right? There's not a lot of detail. It's not all there. The the motion and the, the beauty is not all there. You have to chisel away at it a little bit more. Um, so three, four rewrites are, are ideal. Um, and I'm sure I got to rewrite the, you know, like the final scene with Ezio and Altair and talk about it with the directors and 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 really um, get it get it right. Mm, yeah. Thank you, thank you for that <laughs> elaborate answer. We always like uh, like you to talk more about them. So, <laughs> and next, I, I remember seeing I remember seeing a John Cage a John Cage interview where he he would have a stopwatch, and before he would answer a question, he'd do this. Or no, he had a random number generator, and from one to like a thousand, a hundred, and he would say like, okay, this next question I will answer in random number generator six seconds. Ah. And this nice. next one will be 73 seconds, and he would have to stick to it. I should do that because... Well, well get, get ready for that for the rapid-fire question. Okay, good. You're right. <laughs> All um, right, so um, James, yeah, yeah James, uh, you are up with your question. If you can just pause your game for just a minute. I can. I've finished uh, climbing Galata Tower now, so uh, okay. let's let's go <laughs> to the questions. Uh, yes. Um, Assassin's Creed has grown from a single game to a complex multimedia franchise with a huge army of characters, locations, and so on. Um, the fan wiki, I checked when I wrote this question, has over 22,000 articles. Yep. Does this established history and set of characters, does it become restrictive for writers, or does it provide a well of resources that you can use for telling new stories? <clears throat> It's not restrictive uh, because the world is pr the our, the AC universe is pretty rich and pretty flexible, uh, and you know there's a lot of history out there. Just uh, turn around and, and turn around and look behind you. It's all there. Um, it it is difficult though because um, it's I think sometimes f like the dream for fans is that, oh, like, well, we've got it all, you know, we've got all this history, just go play all the games and go read all the Wikipedia articles and you'll know the history as well as we do and then go write and make sure you don't contradict any existing lore. <laughs> the thing is that's really hard, though, is sometimes you just, you don't know that there is something to know, you know, like, and, and even the best of us, like, um, and make up something that has this weird connection to the past that you're like, oh yeah, it's it's even hard to know that that's actually a contradiction of something that was stated in the past. So what I try to do is, is kind of look at it like real history, which is um, we can't even agree on real history, right? Like there are certain things that are difficult to know. Like you know, let's say, let's take low hanging fruit like the like um, the conspiracy theory around you know how. John F. Kennedy died, right? Um, that's like Assassin's Creed material right there. It's like there's a conspiracy there. There's a dearth of information about what actually went on. So you're free to kind of speculate and fill in the details. And there are people who are committed to certain narratives, right? There are other people who are just like, well, we just don't know. And, 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 and here's, the, here's the facts as we kind of know them. So I think that um, maybe from the start that we had said like, hey, you know, there's genetic memory, but genetic memory is fallible because m human memory is fallible. If we'd stated that at the outset, then we could have this kind of excuse for multi-layered, um, multi, uh, multiple interpretations of, of history, right? Something like the, the film Rashomon, right? Where an event happens, 
but then four people tell the story of their memory of what happens, and it's all very different. I think maybe that's that's a kind of a a generous view of of how memory works and how history ought to work, and then how Assassin's Creed history ought to work, is that sometimes people remember things differently. So you, uh, I've always thought a really cool way of of handling it would be well. Actually, one thing that I thought would be interesting in Valhalla or any of the games where there's dialogue choice is to kind of have a have a mode at the at the back end where because um, because the um, what are the games uh, the Walking Dead does this after you play an episode it says 80% of people chose this one 53% of people chose this one and that would kind of like be how the isu calculations work if, if it was like if it was like 95% of people chose this choice then you could be like, well, then that's probably the truth because that's that's how many people synchronized in that way. Okay, but if it was like, oh, 50% or 30% chose this, 30% chose this, and 40% chose this, you'd be like, wow, we really don't know what the truth is here because we can't get like a real good, clear synchronization on that fact. Um, that, that would be an interesting way to, to treat genetic memory. Um, <laughs> maybe in the future. I also, I also I like... Know. That's no promise. I got. <laughs> there's this one feature. There's this one feature I really liked in Black Flag, and I think it was in three as well. Um, you guys had us rating the memories. Um, I think it was on so... in XC4. I, I don't yeah, think it was yeah, in yeah. three. Yeah, yeah. Seneca you had it as had, well, had randomly. Like... Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, it was, we, it was in four because of the whole con the the conceit that you were part of Abstergo Entertainment. Oh yeah. Right. So. So it was just oh. kind of just it was justified like by your bosses going, did you like that sequence? Should we use that for oh, Devils of the Caribbean? <laughs> yeah, it's that's a deep. yeah. Mm. I was just gonna um, too dish. <laughs> I was just gonna say on the point of that genetic memory, what you mentioned, Darby, is an idea I had about Odyssey. Randomly, I did suggest to the community that with the choices you could have, this choice has a higher synchronization probability where this other choice may have a lower probability of synchronization. And yeah. it shows that the memory may not be viable, but from what the animus can say, this option may have a higher probability of being yeah. the kind of yeah. memory. And it's really yeah. to show that flexibility of the memory. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think the, the ideal AC game, if we were to ever do that, the ideal game would make it about that, rather than just some sort of lore excuse for contradictions. <laughs> but like... Imagine a game where, like, if trying to figure out the accurate accuracy was actually the entire point of the game. Um, that'd be really interesting. I would play that. Yeah. Yes. Um, but uh, so uh, due due to the time that we have, um, Wolfie, do you do you want to go to yeah. the next question? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, so uh, what are some of your favorite moments in the series that you worked on? And then maybe what are some of the f moments that you didn't work on, but you feel are done really well or very important to the series? Mm -hmm. I think my favorite moments are probably a lot of the fan favorite moments. I, I tend to have a sense of when I'm writing something that, that it, 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 if we execute it right, it could end up being really great. Um, you know, like it's, you know, these games are made by hundreds of people. So it, it requires everyone being, uh, you know, in sync to make these things great. But I, I, I do really love the ending of Revelations. Um, yes. <laughs> I love a lot of the interactions with Sophia as well. I like this idea of this parallel story of like Ezio's kind of falling in love at the same time. He's like murder and baddies. And so he, and he's like, oh, there's a tension there. So I, I really liked all of those um, those moments. Um, I mean, the AC4 was definitely just my favorite to write because every moment felt really great because I really, I was very de dedicated in that one to making sure that the language felt um, stylized in a way that felt older. Um, I know my the historian Colin Woodard, who we used, uh, uh, who was actually my historical research partner because he'd written a great book. When I sent him parts of the script, he's like, it sounds a little more early 18th century than early 17th century, Darby. I'm like, oh, good enough. 
But because uh, it's true, because if you try to go full early 17th century and you you try to talk like the general history of pirates, that book it's pretty thick. It's pretty impenetrable. So, Very thick. Yes. Yeah. So so you know I, I I bumped it up a little bit early 18th century. Um, but that that was just like from front to back. Writing like that was really like like uh, gentlemen, we do not act. You know, uh, what is that? You know, according to our own collective madness. Just that speech. I remember writing it pretty early and having fun writing in that with that cadence and that rhythm and that that style. And going like, oh, this will be good. This will be really fun. And the actors had a lot of fun with it. Um, so yeah. Um, and I mean, a ton of stuff in Valhalla. I didn't write all of Valhalla, obviously. I was more of like an editor, right? Like the scripts would come in, and I would, I would have a look at them, and I would do rewrites where I thought they were necessary. But really, that's a uh, that game is very much a collective effort. Um, that is true. So uh, that that in and of itself is a very different process, and it's a very fun one. But it's quite different than being a solitary writer. And you know, like I wrote the main path of AC4. Jill Murray wrote the, all the side content, um, but we did it kind of. I did mine, she did hers. We looked over it together, and and so that I felt more like a writer on that game. Yeah. And so that was just a special one. AC4 is a gem. So is uh, any anything that that you're involved in is a gem, Darby. <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, well, but, I could show you some short stories I've written that are that are not a gem. <laughs> <laughs> we learn as we go. <laughs> yep. Um, so, so it's time for the rapid. Wait, clearly fire, but... you've never played The Sims busting out. That's. Yeah, Sims busting out the Herbs DS, uh, the, all the DS games. My... The, Sims, the Sims Two for the DS. Yeah, yeah. All my me, girlfriend all, loves all me, them. Yeah, yeah. She doesn't know who the you Sims, are, but she the loves Sims... the Sims. <laughs> The Sims 2 <laughs> DS is, get, is getting this weird renaissance. Like, search for it on Google. There, are, I've been contacted a number of times for interviews for that. I don't know what's happening, but people are, like, rediscovering. Or it's people who played it have grown up, and now they're game journalists. <laughs> they want to share their love for it. But that was a wild one. But anyway, that is not the topic of this stream. So <laughs> so, so uh, let's, let's move on to some rapid-fire questions. Um, excellent, excellent. The rules of this, Darby, is you have one or two sentences um, okay. Okay. to say about them. So, Love me uh, let's start. Uh, Andiamo. Favorite AC game? AC4. AC4. Yes. Cool. Yes, cool. Yes, cool. yes, yes, yes. <laughs> best, best assassin character? Um, I actually do I mean, quite love Altair. Yes. Um, and Connor and Edward, but see, Edward's not really an assassin for most of it. But I still like, yeah, Connor <laughs> out there. So it's Edward. equal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like Evie okay. as well. Oh, Evie's amazing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the the nerdy Archer is just being like a <laughs> like a fan right now. And um, you only get two sentences too. Oh yes. Okay. All right. Well. <laughs> okay. Best Templar. Best Templar, well, um, Ahmed and and uh, Haytham. Um, yeah, that's yeah. that's good. Haytham Two is words, Haytham three is words, awesome. and. Um, Alrighty, so uh, let me see. Uh, the favorite opening scene of an Assassin's Creed game. Um, I do like, I, I'm biased because I like the opening of AC4 because it dumps you, jumps you right into the action. I do love the opening of Origins as well because it just gets you right into the character. Um, so it's a super intense adrenaline shot. So Origins yes, and it AC4. Is. <laughs> I never sleep. Uh, <laughs> okay, so uh, best, best theme song or track of, or, of Assassin's Creed. Mm. Mm -hmm. Oh man, there are some Valhalla ones that I, I really, I don't even know the names of them, but just some of the uh, ambient at wandering, like I think there's a Northumbria at night one where you, when you're roaming around that was just, just killed me when I first heard it in the game and it's just, I loved it so much. And there's some Wessex stuff that I really love from Sarah. One was Jesper, one was Sarah. I do also love the Revelations theme because I remember, if you recall, there was actually a contest where 
uh, we had uh, composed it, but then we did a fan, we, we searched through the fans to see who would sing it, and it was actually a fan who uh, provided the voice for it. So she, uh, she was picked out of, you know, hundreds of entries, and we found her. So she's a, that was a really wonderful moment, seeing that song come together. So it's kind of, as a, a we, we go look for uh, old YouTube videos uh, uh, documenting that process, but it was I've great. I've seen, I've seen that one. I've seen that. Yeah, video. yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Nice. Um, so, uh, I think you're talking about ba Valhalla Nights. Um, the song that I, I don't know. I don't know if we if we play it here, but I'll go look yeah, later yeah. and I'll, I will confirm. Yeah. <laughs> Um, anywho, uh, next question. Jackda or Morgan? Jackda. Is that a, that's a real question? Uh, well, <laughs> I know. No, I'm I, know. I just wanted you to say Jackda. Uh, so, um, also, uh, sticking with the AC Rogue vibes, do you make your own luck? No. No. No, that's what Two Face does, though. I am I am a completely deterministic and materialistic person. I material in the philosophical materialism, not like I love things, <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> but that I'm I'm only flesh and blood, and everything's deterministic, and there's no such thing as luck. <laughs> I don't know, just cool. Cool. that was way more than uh, two sentences. Apologies. Well, uh, we. We are going quickly through those, so that's good. Uh, so, favorite Hidden Blade? Oh, man. I don't think I've looked at them close enough to... Should, should I be obvious and say the hook blade? No, I don't know. Um, <laughs> you can. I don't, I, don't, I don't really you know. See, there was the something hook. really elegant about Arno's. I, do they do? Do all of them have names? I don't know. And yeah, then Eivor, Eivor, Eivor's was great because I loved. I loved the that it's this Viking that has this, you know, uh, this hidden blade that is from more of like a the Middle Eastern culture. Like it's that contrast is really cool. Um, yeah. So I like that one a lot too. Just the 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 origin of that hidden blade, like the you know how it, how far it traveled to get to Eivor is very cool. It tells a story. Yeah. It's like the red violin, <laughs> something. Plus the backstory that she she loves to show it off, and uh, yeah. yeah. We could have we uh, could have hinted at Bassem's character more. He's like, I brought you something, and it's still got like an arm in it, and he's like, Oh, <laughs> pardon me. <laughs> and you're like, whose arm is that? And like, well, that would be the subject of a full DLC. <laughs> um. Okay. So, um, another question. Pick locks or foot stomp to open chest? Um, well, what is it? I'll quit asking your question with a question. Has there ever been a really great lock picking game in any? <laughs> <laughs> Probably foot stomp, just for the. It depends on the game, right? Like, like if I'm playing like, um, you know, something really grounded, like you know, the Kingdom Come, then I want it like a, a really like authentic lock picking game but if i'm playing something a little bit more arcadey and like fast paced then yeah stomp it stomp it mm. crack that open definitely <laughs> okay so next question were there other titles you were thinking of for ac Revel ac revelations uh i had a lot of them i always like whenever i'm working on something i like spit i'm always like bothering the, the pr and marketing like how about this how about this how about this how about this and then I don't think I'm allowed to actually, you know, tell you what they were. Was is it is is there already fan like knowledge about what there there was like I don't know. Lost Lost Legacy. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. No. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. um I think No, I, I mean I, it's fine for me. Like I think I think Revelations was a weird one. It, it always felt appropriate to me because it was all about Ezio you know, getting these revelatory moments about what he ought to be doing with his life and who he was. I'm just a conduit for a message that it, I think fans interpreted it like, hey, we're going to tell you everything about what the weird stuff that's happening in this series. And that's not that's not actually. Yeah, that's not actually what we meant by revelations. Like it's it's the revelations were happening to Ezio. We weren't oh, going to be yeah, like, yeah, yeah. you know, we weren't going to be 
spilling the beans like who is the first civ you I know mean, i mean it, yeah it, it, so. it also has a title of like double meaning too like you know um but it's a personal m meaning to Ezio, yeah. Yeah. you know uh being being revealed anyway these are <laughs> rapid fire uh, <laughs> um we can talk forever about them but uh i, I also want uh, wanted to ask you this question who did you enjoy writing more for basim altair Ezio, edward or avor and why um I think, I mean, like I've said earlier, Edward was the most fun to write, uh, mainly because it was just such a labor of love from beginning to end, and, and I felt like a a solitary scribbler with my typewriter and my, or my, you know, my napkin and a pencil and and just doing that. Um, Eivor was also actually quite fun because, uh, especially in the early days when it was like, when I was just writing kind of we do sometimes we do a lot of like tone tests like hey what ought this game sound like like let's write some sample scripts and writing with alain mercieka the the writer of origins and he and i were the first uh writers on on the game of valhalla and we would like kind of write out stuff and there, you know there's these things called kennings in in norse uh in old norse where you know like um you know Heart fire would be like ambition, or um, um, raven perch might be your shoulder, right? Using these cool extended metaphors. And so we had a lot of fun writing that, like, what should that sound like? What should these people sound like? Um, mm. So that was quite that was quite fun. And then the, the challenge with t like twelve writers on Valhalla was that how to then take that knowledge and and, and disperse it to twelve very different writers because everyone has a different style and. And it was my first time where I was like, hey, I need to try to get all these writers to write kind of in the same tone so that it feels like one game. And that's where my editorial you know, side came in, is like once you get scripts, if you feel like a script is not quite in the same style, if it's like, oh, this sounds more like a, you know, like a, you know, a, a, a Robert Towns script, like it sounds like Chinatown and not like a, Actually, the movie The Northman actually has a cool style that also feels drawn from that same well, right? I don't know if you saw yeah. it, but um, so that was that was an interesting challenge to to to, to achieve that. Nice. Well, thank you for um, answering that question so thoroughly. Uh, yeah. I, I wanted a thorough uh, question for the last rapid fire question, so we got it. <laughs> cool. um, <laughs> And now it's time for the silly questions, um, <laughs> as we're calling them. So, Wolfie, take it yep. away. So from Sergalens Flowers, um, would like to know, how hard was it to come up with the rhymes in the mission where Ezio sings his biographical ditties at the palace party? <laughs> that was, that wasn't too hard. So half of those were written by me and half of those were written by, um, Nick Grimwood, who is actually the guy who writes all the crowd chatter. I think he's written them for almost every single Assassin's Creed game. Um, hmm. And he's got a bit of a musical poetic sense to him, too. Um, and he's written, uh, when, when you hear a lot of people say, like, what's your favorite lines from Assassin's Creed? And, it, and, and some people will pick crowd life dialogue. He wrote all that. Um, like, he's late. He must be late and she must be beautiful, that kind of thing. <laughs> Um, I think that's an AC2. Um, so he wrote half of those, and I wrote half. I think there's about 20 of them. Um, and it was really fun. I mean, it was. I think it was very quick. We just kind of banged them out over the over one or two nights. And, uh, and we didn't record them to any kind of music. We just had this horrible, awful music. Right, like on this lyre or lute or whatever it was. And it's completely atonal, like it just doesn't make any sense. And and then Roger Craig Smith, he just got in there and he's like, okay, listening to that, great, all right. Now sing as off key as possible. Okay, good. So it, it was, was fun. amazing. <laughs> yeah. It, it was amazing. It was done so well. Um, yeah. So was the hook and the blade part, which we have mm. come to that question. Mm. Uh, the hook and the blade uh, code, Darby. Where did yeah. it come from? It's, so it's such I think a I've, place in the community. Yes, I've told this story before. I, I can't remember exactly how the, the timeline, but what happened was we revealed the, that we had a hook blade, I think, you know, like an early press 
thing, some press preview, and fans kept asking, like, wait, wait I don't get it. Is it a hook? Is the blade on the hook? Or is the is like it two separate things? And for some reason, like, I got worried that fans wouldn't understand, so I overwrote the explanation in the script. Like, I think that was one of the last things I wrote. Because it was like, oh, the fans are confused as to how it works. So it's like, oh, God, I better be really ultra clear. In retrospect, I probably, well, I mean, hey, it's, it's great. Everyone loves it, right? It's brilliant. It's the it's worst brilliant. writing ever. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> if bad writing can become, it's kind of through some kind of perverse osmosis can be good writing. So, Darby. you know, Darby, why not? Darby. Let's go. It's an elegant design, okay? It's an elegant yeah, yeah. design. It's an elegant oh, design. Oh, get out of here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey, look, guys, that's my time, so, no. <laughs> um, so, Declan, Declan, uh, what's your, what, uh, can you say the, the question from a community member uh, yeah. that was asked? I guess, so this is from Bert Ozturk. Um, why do we go to Cappadocia by ship? There is no sea in Cappadocia. And I don't yeah, know if I, I have... pronounced that right. <laughs> Yeah, I don't. I always Cappadocia. say Cappadocia. Jo Cappadocia. Yeah, Cappadocia. Um, huh. I have no idea. Like I, I, I've, I think most of. I don't know. I don't. You know what I think it was? I think it was that my, the script actually said Ezio arrives by horse, uh, because it's in the middle of you know Turkey. Uh, yeah. And, but, someone probably politely reminded me is like. Like, well, we don't have a horse that we can easily put, like, mocap and put in and animate in a cutscene. Like, like, I think they were doing all their effort on just the ending of Selim. I think if you watch Selim's entrance with, with like, lots of guards, it's very... Oh, yeah, he's, like, It's very, like, a little wonky, right? It's Because it, it was, like, we don't have that, right? The horse didn't become a... Well, there's a horse in Brotherhood now that I think about it, but I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why it was by boat. Um... There's sometimes you you write a script and you and you give it to people and then what you get back is like oh that's uh that's different <laughs> so I don't know yeah yeah um and and uh, on that note I I just wanted to also uh, remind people if you have just joined us uh, that we are doing a, fu a fundraiser for. Uh, Syria and Turkey. Uh, Cappadocia is in Turkey, so um, yeah. Any donations that uh, you, you feel you can you, you can give us, uh, it will be wonderful. Uh, and, every dollar helps. Uh, yeah, every dollar. Yeah, every dollar helps, and especially in Syria and Turkey. Um, so, so yeah, we're doing it for the kids, and we're having a, a good time with, with the community with Darby over here. Um, so, uh, Wolfie, what, yep. what was the question uh, that <laughs> community members asked, uh, yep. known community members? This one's actually <laughs> from, from two different, we had two different people who asked pretty much the same question. Uh, Marco from Axis Anonymous. And uh, we had Tax Alex again from Assassin's Creed series. Um, who is the guy on the bench in Embers when Ezio died? And once and for all, was the young Florentine noble in Embers a Templar or not? You're not going to answer that question, are you? <laughs> no, there, there is no there is no answer. Yeah. <laughs> oh, why is it? Why is it? Well, <laughs> there. There's no answer. I don't even know it. I don't even know it. I didn't like that guy. Just showed up and you know and, and sat down and like I, I have no idea. Hey, I was he wasn't even in the script. He just showed up and sat down and he just started yeah. talking. And I don't know. While hey, we were shooting, we're, while, while we were shooting, we're like, who's that guy? And then it turned out like our lead, our lead was dead after that. So we're like, what the? <laughs> what do we do? We had to say we had a whole it was actually supposed to be a full length feature film, but he died, you know, 23 minutes into it. So what do we you know? Well, one day, one day you'll, you'll answer that question. If, if, if he writes, if that guy writes me an email and tells me I, I am a Templar or I am just a guy or I am a ghost. <laughs> 
he'll come haunt you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Until he tells me, uh, I don't know. There's no answer to that question. Uh, um, sir, if you... sir, if you're if you're on the internet in Renaissance Italy right now, please uh, <laughs> contact Arsh the assassin and our wolf. I will Wolfie. get in touch with Darby. Yeah, yeah, and, and let me know. Uh, yeah. Um, Declan, uh, you you had a question about um, a game that you and Darby both both like, right? <laughs> yes, um, my, me and Darby right. have a few games in common. Uh, this question is from MC Gillies Farid. I think I pronounced that right. Did John from IT play Dark Souls, and what was his favorite video game if he played any? And John from IT, he started Dark Souls six times, and he can't get past the Asylum beast, the, the Asylum demon, and uh, you know it's embarrassing, really. You know, you just just, sum just summon it. somebody, just summon somebody, accept help, John. <laughs> you know? um, it's okay to ask for help. Yeah, <laughs> this is a community. We're we're all in this together. No, he just yeah. He, d he probably doesn't even like video games. He probably <laughs> just watches a lot of TV. Uh, he's, a, he's obsessed about Juno. That's enough. Dreams for Juno. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He doesn't even have time to play games. He's like, how do I resurrect my beloved wife who's been dead for 75,000 years? <laughs> um, okay. I think. And, so from, uh, yeah, speaking from, of Juno. Yeah, yeah we have. Uh, um, go ahead. We have we have uh, qu another question from Marco uh, from Access the Animus. Uh, he only gets one. Um, no. Uh, <laughs> well, okay. If he, yeah, okay, you can ask it, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'm gonna ask something in return. It's actually it's it, it's actually a two-parter question. Uh, I think. So, what was truly in the box uh, of of Ezio Darby? Hmm. Uh, that's quotations from him. Um, yeah. And uh, the second question is, did Subject 16 truly die in Revelations? Okay, okay. Well, um, what's in the box? I don't know, just like Ezio's hopes and dreams, I guess. Yeah, um, yeah. And a map. And, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, another box. <laughs> um, and then, uh, did Subject 16 really die? Well, I think... I think uh, it, the thing is, is like considering what he was, um, there, this is a question that gets back to what you call the um, maybe the transporter problem. Like he uploaded his consciousness into this, you know, let's say the gray or whatever. Um, presumably, it's very easy to replicate that consciousness if he's just a digital entity. So maybe there's another subject 16. Is it the same subject 16? That's the whole essence behind, behind the the transporter problem is like if 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 you're transported from here to there and you they kill this body and they recreate this body are you the same person or are you a new person with the memories of the old person so maybe maybe there's a subject 16 out there that's actually um a copy of the original but he didn't go through what that version went through so maybe he's out there again um presumably we could use him again Anybody who's in that state, we could use again. You know, they're they're digital. You know, maybe maybe somebody's made a, a, a yeah, multiple copies of oh. all these people. Oh, the questions and the future. We'll yeah, leave yeah, that. we don't know. We we'll, don't know. We'll leave that. We'll leave that to um, to that to the future. Um, okay. <laughs> but but yeah, James. Uh, I I think you had a you had a question from a fan too, right? I do, uh, yes. Ask. Um, and... <coughs> I do, so um, I read this question out just as my dog decides to start barking at a cat outside, which I hope the microphone <laughs> doesn't pick up. But anyway, let's go with it. So, last question um, from Diecast314. Darby at one point mentioned that he still had an old draft of Lost Legacy before it was turned into Revelations. Will we ever get to hear anything about that original story? Huh. Yes. How about I read you some of that story right now? No. no. That's... <laughs> How about Yeah, that? actually, it's funny. It's, yeah, because he's the question you mentioned at one point. It's like, yeah, I actually mentioned it earlier in the stream, sort of by accident. So, <laughs> yeah, 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 I do have that I old script. 
I was like wondering have... about, about Lost Legacy. Yeah, I do have the old script. I have a. Uh, it's a full script of the game. It's. I don't think it's a particularly good script. But what's interesting about it is that it actually has. Um, we actually had an old codex that we were going to do all. Or, uh, uh, sorry, a um, historical database. We were going to go all do all these database entries. We also did um, something like 30 entries for Niccolo and Maffeo Polo. So the journal that is handed over to um, uh, that Altair, or no, r the reverse. Sorry, no, no, that's Altair's codex. Um, oh, wait, I'm, now I'm getting confused. But anyway, the point is we had a, we had a Niccolo Polo's journal where you get to sort of read his entire journey, his meeting with Altair. And then I had written some extra Altair codex entries uh, for the last part of his life. So if, with your permission, I'll read you the, the final three Altair uh, Codex entries that never saw the light of day, and in fact, uh, hinted at a slightly different ending than Revelations ended up having. So this is, unfortunately, this is non-canon because um, of the, the state of mind that you'll hear Altair is in. Um, but uh, if that's okay, I will read it. Please, please do. Please do. Oh, God. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank so, you. Thank you for putting it here. <laughs> so this is now, keep in mind, this was written in, I have not changed a word, so there might even be like weird phrasings here. But this was written in the middle, so the summer of 2010, before Brotherhood had even come out, um, and before Revelations was an apple in anyone's eye. So, uh, yeah. So what you hear here will maybe hint at other kind of directions the ending could have gone. But anyway, so Altair writes, We have gathered, discussed, and dispersed. The verdict is final. Masyaf will be abandoned. Our beloved castle, castle, so useful for so long, is now a beacon for those who would see us annihilated. The assassins will operate in shadows, spread out over continents, living in secret among the people we protect, not above them. Step by step, we will rout the Templars. A young man named Niccolo will return our message to the West, First to Constantinople, then to Venezia. My sons have done the same through northern Africa. This is how it must happen. This is how our message will be spread. On the strength of our message, not our steel. Oh, I am, that's... I am, <laughs> I'm just going to read them all, and then you can... Then you can Take notes, take notes. Ah, okay. Page two, or, or let's say the penultimate page. I am well beyond the twilight of my life. It is midnight, and there are no stars and no moon to see by. No man should live as long as this. My sons, old enough to be grandfathers, and my Maria, so gone so long. Which of my memories of her are true, and which were projections of that accursed apple? Did I bury her with my own hands, or delegate this task to another? Damn that artifact. Twenty years of my life stolen, replaced by insipid fables and tantalizing dreams. Final entry. Wow. I have done my part. If only I had found the modesty to speak these words earlier, I might have died sooner, yet lived a fuller life. But the apple lured me away with lies. You will solve the riddle, Altair. You will defeat the Templars and find the secret of the ones who came before. I was always one step away, brushing my fingertips against the truth, so close to understanding. And now I'm at the end of my journey. My hands are empty, and I am alone. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Bravo. Oh, wow. Goosebumps. <laughs> yes, I think you. I think you can. You can h interpret that the sort of his last days in this version were, uh, you know, quite a, quite a bit more tragic. Like the idea that he had s studied this apple for so long and it actually just filled his head with, with sort of nonsense, or or he couldn't see truth from fiction anymore, and um, and so he kind of had to sort of like <laughs> give it up and and lock it away or something. Yeah. So yeah, he was, he was kind of like losing his mind, uh, yeah. yeah, in a way, and and wow, yeah, what great re re what great reflections. The, there's a there's a lot of suspense in there, and 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 a lot, a lot that like Etio Etio could have like learned from and stuff like that, yeah, like. Do you think that that's why maybe like uh, Etia was like, oh no, I, I've had enough of you, apples. I, well, I don't think I don't think in, in Revela the revelations that came to be, I don't think Altair is nearly that far gone, right? I think he's he he's tired certainly, and he's he feels like I think there's a sense that he 
he pushed himself to the limit, but he's like, now it's time for the new generation to take it forward. Um, but, uh, but I don't think there's that deep sense of like being led astray. It's all, I mean, I think I remember writing it like it was almost intended to be like he was some kind of, he was addicted to that apple. Like it was showing him things and he couldn't look away. Um, and this is of course before, right? If you think about the time it was written, it's like the only thing that, that anyone knew about these apples was from AC one and two, right? Even brotherhood wasn't out yet. And, and I was writing as, as, like, I think the writers of the, at the time were like Corey and Jeffrey, right? And so I was maybe the third writer of, on this series, I believe. Um, and so we're kind of still feeling out like, what are these Apple? What's what's the what's the full range of capabilities of these pieces of Eden? Like, we're we're still kind of in you know inventing that. I'm, as I was writing that, I'm sure Jeffrey was writing the you know Brotherhood. So we're still yeah. at the very beginning of this journey. And I and I think uh, now I think this script was approved by Corey. I think he read it and was like, "Yeah, that fits with what we did in Assassin's Creed 2 and what we're planning to do in AC3." So I'm I'm pretty sure this is a fairly final script. It might have gone through some revisions, but that was that was a uh, yeah. Well, um, so it was fun. It's, it's, thank it's nice, you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, expect of course the access the animus breakdown uh, within yes within about <laughs> within about three hours. Yeah, uh, Marco's I already know. edited it. <laughs> Marco's like, ooh, goodies. <laughs> <laughs> Got a lot of stuff, Marco. Go work. Go work. Um, uh, oh, hey, he's di he's direct messaging me right now. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> Not a surprise. <laughs> oh man, uh, that's cool. That's cool. But, but yeah, uh, well, that about wraps up um, the 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 questions. That's a good good point to uh, leave on. Uh, I think, <laughs> like, obviously, and. Yeah, thank you so much, Darby, for for your time, um, for your attention uh, to the cause. Uh, we're really grateful that you had the chance to like come and talk to us and raise awareness about uh, what's happening in Turkey and Syria. So we're really grateful. Thank you so much. It's it's a pleasure as always. It's good to see everybody again. Yeah, uh, it indeed is. And as as for you uh, guys uh, in in the chat we still have a lot of uh thing community events uh planned we we in fact have a live stream from overly sarcastic productions uh coming up in one hour uh we're gonna be playing bonfire of the vanities so uh come over there and it's on youtube come over there you can win some giveaways to over there and uh, yeah just help raise awareness uh give us your retweets your likes your uh your your reposts and if you can donate for a good cause to help the children in turkey and syria um james declan it, it's your show so um finish it up <laughs> i don't think there's any better way we can finish it than that thank you for everyone for uh, for watching for listening thank you for everyone who donated and as, as Arshek said, there's still a lot more um, what we hope is entertaining and enjoyable content to come over the next, what is it, four days, five days? So, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me, too. I really I really appreciated this. And, Darby, it was wonderful to, to chat with you again. Thank you. Thank you.